Landas. Um, today, I am very, very happy to welcome Marinelle Vasquez, whose work I deeply admire for a lot of years. Marinelle is an assistant professor in Yale's computer science department, where she leads the interactive machines group. She received her bachelor degree in computer engineering from the University Simon Bolivar in Venezuela, and she obtained her master's and PhDs at in robotics in CNU. Before joining Yale, Marinel was a collaborator of Disney Research and a postdoc in Stanford. Currently, Marinel research focuses on human robot interaction, especially in multi party settings. She's particularly interested in investigating social group phenomena in HRI and develop perception and decision making algorithms that enable autonomous robot uh, behaviors. She has open positions in her lab, so you should also check that out if you're interested in working with Marinelle. And today she's going to present the group human robot interaction challenges and opportunities of data driven techniques. Welcome, Marinelle, and the stage is yours. Thank you so much. So let me share my screen here. All right. Hopefully you can see. Actually, let me. Let me do one more thing. Make sure I click here, optimize for video. All right, cool. So thank you so much um, for the opportunity to be here. This is quite exciting, especially because as I said before, there's lots of you know people here and especially some good old friends from my time at Disney even, which is kind of fun. Um, and so today I, I really want to focus my presentation on this topic of group human robot interaction. And I want to start by, you know, sort of giving you a broad overview of what this is about. So the main idea here is, you know, for a long time, we have been thinking about one on one interactions in human robot interaction. And the reality is that when you look around, you know, happens that there's oftentimes lots of people. And this has brought a lot of interest to sort of this problem, right? This means how do people perceive robots when they're in groups? How do they interact with them? How can we enable robots to best reason about this type of multi-party social encounters? Now, thinking about this um, problem, I would say over the last maybe 10 years or so, there has been a lot of interesting work that has gotten me really, really excited about um, sort of this research area. And maybe this is, you know, a very small sample of all of that, but just to give you an idea, right? There has been work on thinking about what it means to have in-groups and out-group effects in these interactions. There has been lots of interesting work in how robots can drive group dynamics. This might be within teams, it might be within, you know, intergenerational family members. And there has also been sort of interesting work in how can we, in a way, motivate people to act in pro-social ways sort of within this space. And just to kind of give you a quick hint of what I mean by this, um, for instance, this experiment that we did in my lab two years now ago, um, we were trying to see how could we have robots motivate a person to intervene when someone else mistreated a robot. And I know this sounds hard, but it turns out, you know, at least in nature, I, we can start seeing some, some effects like this that suggest that robots have, you know, a strong potential um, sort of effect that they can use in people in this type of interactions. Now, when at a, in, a, in a high level, I think about a lot of this work, there's always a catch that, you know, comes to me. And this is definitely true for my own work, right? And that is that for the most time in this type of, of interactions, we're following a, a very well-defined script, right? Because we're designing our experiment to study this thing or this other thing, and everything is super controlled. And naturally, right, what that means is that we can get very far with very simple robot behaviors and even perception algorithms. But on, on the other side, right, this naturally sort of brings up the question of, how can we advance robot autonomy for group HRI? And so this is gonna be kind of the, the main topic of my talk today. Now, this, this goes without saying, if you have any question about sort of work that I've done in the more experimental side of things, feel free to ask me you know, about it at the end of the talk. 
But you know, for my 30 minutes, I'll, I'll try to do a good job of focusing on this question. Naturally, you know, when you think about this question, there's a whole spectrum of solutions, right? And so you can go from very model-based approaches to enable autonomy to more data-driven approaches. And what I'm going to do today is sort of argue for a part of this space that is around, you know, where that circle is in, the, in my slide. And so these are structured data-driven methods that hopefully we can use to start um, sort of accelerating the pace of technical work in group HRI. Now, what you'll notice, right, is that I'm a little bit more to the right than to the left here, because I think that there is a lot of potential for data-driven methods to allow us to reason about really complex phenomena that is going on in these interactions. But at the same time, I'm not fully on the 100% data-driven sort of side of this spectrum, because I do believe that adding structure to these models is essential to actually make them work, right? If you just throw your problem to your black box machine learning algorithm, you know, you steer the pile as much as you can until you get some solution, chances are this is not gonna work for HRI, right? And so the question is what kind of structure should we add to these models to hopefully get to, to a good solution? Now, the reality is that what I'm telling you today has been kind of, you know, in my head for a while because my, a lot of my prior work was actually more on the left side. And so to motivate some of what I'm going to talk about in terms of data-driven methods, I want to start by telling you a little bit about this, this prior work. And so when I, I was a PhD student um, at Carnegie Mellon, one of my tasks was to make this furniture robot that you see here interact with children. And the very first time we tested out this robot in this kind of setup, the robot was 100% teleoperated, okay? And what we did was we designed a whole script for the robot to engage children. And so that the main goal here was to give them a souvenir for having come to our lab to test a couple of different technologies. Now, to my surprise, what happened was that as the interaction was evolving, the members of the conversation suddenly changed. And new conversations started right in front of a robot, even though it was still trying to engage the children and they were just, you know, doing whatever nearby, engaging perhaps with an adult or engaging between them, kind of showing each other what they had gotten from the robot. And so at the time, right, my, my question was like, whoa, how can we enable this type of robots to recognize that this is going on and who's interacting with whom? Who is actually part of its conversational group? And what we realized was that oftentimes people were standing relative to one another in very repetitive and particular ways. And it turns out that actually this is very, very common in human interactions. When you engage in a conversational interaction with someone else in an open space and you're standing, you will oftentimes stand in, in these particular ways, maybe face to face in L-shaped formations or in more circular formations. And we call this type of spatial arrangements F formations or phase formations um, because they're very you know, particular of this type of interactions. Now we have seen in HRI that with robots like the one that I showed you before, people tend to stand in very similar ways. And so what we said at the time was, well, let's take you know, this description of this type of um, conversational formations from social psychology and try to implement it in an algorithm so that the robot can recognize who's part of its conversational group. And the way we did that was in a way very simple. So, you know, imagine that you have some people in a scene. We tried to model what we call their transactional segment, which is just the space in front of their body that includes whatever they're engaged with. And we said, well, people generally, when they converse with one another, they intersect their transactional segments with one another generating what we call the O space of the F formation. And if we can identify these O spaces, we can say, oh, there's a group happening here and those intersecting their transactional segment with the O space are members of that group, yeah? Now, lucky for me, this actually got us quite far from uh, the point of view of studying different autonomous behaviors in a robot in a lab environment where people were kind of coming and going away from the robots conversational group. And so let me just show you an example here. Um, so what you have on the ground is a polygon that tells us the group that was estimated at that time. 
And you can see that even though perception is sometimes really bad, so like our skeletons are very bad, people are kind of being badly tracked at times, you know, the group that we were estimating was somewhat reasonable. And that was cool because we could study, you know, how gaze influenced the group, how body orientation influenced the group and, and things like that. Now, I wanted, of course, to get this robot to do this kind of thing in more unconstrained scenarios. And when I started to think about what this meant, well, you know, different, different ideas came to my mind. Perhaps if you're in a museum, now you have people that are not just kind of randomly standing by, but maybe they're in a line. And within that line, you have sort of subgroups that are happening, or maybe people are entering an elevator, now personal space. That notion totally changes because you're constrained because of the tight space in the elevator. And I just couldn't really find a very effective way to make my simple mathematical model adapt to all these many factors that could be influencing what's going on. And so, you know, my natural reaction to this was, well, maybe we should move, you know, more towards the data driven side of this spectrum, right? Maybe we need more flexible and generalizable models. And fitting all the parameters is not just something that we're doing manually, but actually, you know, we take advantage of machine learning to do that more effectively. And so thinking about this problem, one sort of set of constraints came, came along, right? If you think about um, applying machine learning to group HRI, there is some problems that are very pe peculiar to this space that I want to highlight here. So let me first talk about these, these two. One, we need to support a variable number of interactants. And two, we need models that accept unordered inputs. Okay, and let me try to explain why. So let's say that you wanted to apply machine learning to a group HRI problem. And hypothetically, I have you know, two users and a robot. Perhaps an easy way to do this is you say, I'm gonna come up with some feature representation for people and some feature representation for my robot. And now I'm gonna concatenate those, pass them through my machine learning model and make a prediction, right? And this machine learning model might be a random forest, an SBM, it might be a neural network, whatever you like. Now, this type of approach is actually quite convenient and I would say straightforward to implement. And it has been really interesting to see it applied to group HRI because you can use it to model things like engagement at a group level, as in this paper that I'm showing you here in the right. But if you know you try to apply this in a more unconstrained scenario, then suddenly perhaps someone else comes along and now your model that was expecting this number of inputs has to deal with additional inputs that oh, that was not sort of you know envisioned originally. So how does your model can take that extra information in, right? That's a problem. So maybe you're thinking, aha, uh -huh, I know we can enlarge this input, you know, feature space, have some features that are null features that whenever I have say two people instead of three, the space for the third person is null features and just run it so that if someone else comes along, I can always pass in more information. And if you do that, what tends to happen in these type of problems is, because oftentimes there's a lot of things that we care about one person, for instance, there's a lot of features that you need to add as potential extra inputs to your model. And so if you do that and say you grow your model to maybe up to, I don't know, 10 people, suddenly you're turning your machine learning problem into a data sparsity problem, right? Because a lot of the inputs that you're gonna have are these null features and the model has to figure out how to basically ignore them because they're not relevant if you only have two people versus 10 people and so on. And so that sort of seems not ideal from, from a practical perspective. Now, maybe, maybe you're thinking, well, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna create a different model for different group sizes. And this is okay because, well, you know, there's only so many people that can interact with my robot in, in general, right? If you, you cannot really conceive having one robot and maybe a hundred thousand people next to it because you know those people cannot really get to the robot. And if you do that, well, maybe that's okay and maybe that works in practice, but you're gonna effectively split out the amount of data that you have for each of these models. So each of these models will have fewer amount of examples. And given that data is already sparse in HRI, well, you can imagine that it seems like 
maybe what you should try to do is take advantage of data from one type of interaction for other types of interactions. And maybe that's helpful. And you're kind of missing out on that opportunity if you just train this independent model. And so bottom line is here is, you know, ideally it would be great if we could have machine learning models that can deal with a variable number of input pictures because people might come and go to these interactions, okay? Now, everything I've told you so far may seem relevant to you, but maybe you're thinking at this point, hmm, no, no. What I want is to actually create an ML model where my robot is implicit, okay? And so I'm just gonna pass information about my people. And as long as you know the robot is there relative to them in, in a consistent position, maybe that's okay. And maybe I can even simplify my problem from an input perspective that way. And actually I must point out here, um, this paper by, by Patricia and colleagues, where they use a model like this to estimate um, emotional climate in a group interaction. I think this is one of the coolest papers from a perception perspective um, in group HRI, and this is the kind of model they use. Now, of course, right, as I said before, this sounds great if the robot and people are always in roughly the same place, because things I think probably would work, but if you have here some geometric features, say, for instance, things related to, I don't know, head orientation and things like that, and suddenly people will start moving around, now, who your model might have trouble because what do you do if say, you know, the person to the right of the robot moves to the left? Do you swap out the inputs of these people or do you, I don't know, treat them differently relative to the robot? Things start becoming more, more complicated. And so it would be ideal, right? If this machine learning model could actually take these inputs, no matter the order in which you pass them to them. And so this is something that we call typically permutation and variance in machine learning. Now, the last um, requirement that I wanted to mention here is that ideally we want models that allow us to reason about individual and interaction factors. And the reason for this is because group HRI is really complicated. Um, just to quickly explain this, I wanted to point out this review paper that recently came out by Sarah Siebel and colleagues. And they propose this input process output type of framework to think about these interactions. And so as you can see here, right, in terms of inputs for group HRI, you'll have typical things that you might have in dyadic interaction, like individual um, factors related to humans, individual factors related to a robot, and environmental level factors that may matter for your interaction. But then you also have other group level factors that may matter, like the type of group that you have or the composition and size of that group. And even more, I would say you also have interpersonal factors that could play a role here. Like, you know, for instance, say that you wanted to have information about who's gazing at whom in the interaction, maybe who's passing the, the turn to speak to another agent or another person in that interaction. Maybe that also matters in this input space. Now, given all of these inputs, you want to reason about your interaction process and then think about all sorts of different outcomes for perhaps, you know, task performance, perceptions of the group or of the robot, attitude changes, and so on. And so because there's all of this going on, right, you want really flexible models that allow you to reason about individual factors, perhaps, you know, attitude change at an individual level, but also group factors like overall performance of the group in a task and things like that. And so that's sort of, you know, key extra requirement that we have in group HRI that generally makes things somewhat complicated. And so with those requirements in mind, what I wanna tell you is sort of my path to thinking about one type of model here that, that may be um, sort of a good approach for group HRI. And my first idea was to actually think about deep set architectures. So these are neural networks, which are very powerful, right? Because they're, you know, neural networks, they can learn representations from data, but also these are models that are permutation invariant to their inputs, which kind of helps us a little bit perhaps with the order of people into a model. And so you might not know how they work. So let me very briefly give you an overview. Let's say that you have, you know, three elements that you wanna to pass to your model and for each of them, some features, right? This might be my two people and maybe my robot um, can be, you know, different things like that. Now, what you can do is you can take these features and project them to a higher dimensional space. And here, the key would be then 
to apply a element-wise symmetric operation to summarize this set of features into a permutation invariant representation. And so what is a symmetric operation? This is just a mathematical operation where no matter the order of the inputs, I will always get the same result, right? You can think about, for instance, maximum, you can think about summation, you can think about averaging, all those operations doesn't matter the order, at the end you get the same result. And so with this idea in mind, right, what you can do with this type of neural network is go from some inputs no matter the order of these inputs, in terms of say row-wise, how you're passing them to the model, you will end up always getting the same permutation invariant representation. Yeah. And so how do we use this for the context of um, group detection? So the first thing we did was we started thinking about this problem from a graph clustering perspective because actually we didn't have a good way to think about um, combinatorial optimization with neural networks. And so we basically broke the problem into two. So one problem is um, solving a graph clustering approach. And then the key here was to use machine learning to project our input space into a suitable um, representation for doing this graph clustering. And so let me sort of show you in detail. We start with some social scene, okay? Everybody here will now correspond to a node in a graph. This is a fully connected graph. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to use machine learning to compute a weight for all of the edges that once you have that weight, if this weight represents the likelihood of people being part of a group, then what you can do is go and find um, maximum clicks in this graph to find your, your groups. So for instance, you might wanna do this with an algorithm called dominant sets which extends the notions of clicks to these edge weighted graphs. And so the idea of the sets um, sort of comes in here in this um, step C, where we created a neural network that was computing a representation for the um, diet of interest when we were making a prediction for a given edge, but also was computing a representation for the context of that diet which corresponded to information about all the other people nearby. And here we treated these people via a deep set architecture where we were using a maximum symmetric operation to get a permutation invariant representation, okay? And so given this representation for the diet, this representation for the context, which is permutation invariant, then we applied a multi-layer perception to get our edge weight. And then we use that to cluster with dominant sets. And so let me show you just a quick example of this running in our lab. So here are all the features for people are coming out of the Kinect sensor that is giving you, you know, a skeleton. And from there, we're getting people's body orientation and pose. And we're trying to reason about how these people are grouping in relation to this robot that we had in this space. Now, for the groups, we're coloring these avatars with the same color if agents are of the same group. And note that the robot has a super tiny arrow attached to it. Here is yellow, meaning the robot is said to be part of a different group than these two people. And over here, you can see the markers sort of overlaid on the Kinect view. Now, these predictions are being made on a frame-by-frame -frame basis without any temporal consistency. And the red lines that you get to see here, they correspond to um, sort of the edge weights that are computed with the neural network. And when, as you can see here, right, the, the predictions are actually really stable given that we don't have really um, any temporal constraints being applied, which is kind of great. And also this is a very small neural network. So it's also very easy to run on a standard computer. All right. Now, hopefully, you know, I've convinced you that deep sets are interesting for this type of problem. And here comes the twist. So <laughs> it turns out that this type of deep set architectures that I've presented so far are actually a specialization of a broader class of methods called graph neural networks. And so my current idea for this type of problems is, well, perhaps there's really interesting things we can do if we combine graph abstractions for interactions with this type of sort of broader class of methods called graph neural networks. Now, I'm sure that, you know, maybe you've heard about them, but maybe you don't know, all of you know how they work. So again, let me give you kind of a brief overview to how graph neural networks would operate on a graph. So let's say now that I have, you know, a 
a graph that is even more general than what I showed you before, because I also allow to have a global attribute that may describe, for instance, for HRI, things like the environment, okay? So I'm gonna represent my graph with this global attribute plus node attributes plus edge attributes. And know that when I say here attributes, this is just you know feature vectors like before. And so what my graph neural network is gonna do is it's gonna apply a set of operations, which we call a graph network block to transform these input features into my output features. And this happens in three general steps. So first, I'm going to update my edge features. And I'm gonna do that using a differentiable function, say phi, that takes my prior edge feature, the features for the nodes connected to that edge, this is the receiver node, the source node, and my global graph attribute to update my edge feature. So this is basically you know, propagating information from nodes to edges. Now, step two is to propagate information from edges to nodes. And this is where similarities with dip sets start appearing. So you might have a graph, right, where you have different number of edges connected to a node. And so the first step here is to aggregate all that information, oftentimes using a symmetric mathematical operation, which I'm gonna call here raw. Okay, and so this is now computing a aggregate feature for all the edges connected to a node. And then you're gonna use another differentiable function to take the aggregate information, your prior node feature, your global graph attribute, and compute a new representation for your node. And you can do this for all of the nodes in your graph. Now, the last step is to update your global graph attribute. And here you summarize as before information over all edges, over all nodes, take your prior um, global graph attribute and you compute a new attribute based on them using again, some differentiable function. Of course, this is you know, a very general framework. The specifics of what these functions might be would naturally depend on your problem. I'll show you some examples sort of in, later in this talk. Now, just like recurring neural networks, you should think about these graph network blocks as composable operations. And so you might apply you know, one graph network block and then another one and so on to finally, finally get your um, sort of updated graph um, depending on your application. All right. So with that idea in mind, what we decided to try out was to replace our prior um, neural network for computing edge weights with a general message passing architecture. And here we train this um, neural network with just a simple cross entropy loss on the edges because what we care about was building this affinity matrix, yeah. And so what we found here, um, especially in this more complicated data set, which we call match and mingle, is that the more individual features we had for each agent, for each person, then the better the GNN tended to perform. Now that here, higher is better. And to me, this was really interesting because it suggested that these more general message passing architectures are better taking advantage of the relational structure of this problem, of the way we're you know, assembling this abstraction in a graph for, for the interaction. This is something that, you know, by design, basically GNNs are, are meant to do. And you can see they're sort of a benefit in contrast to our more handcrafted um, prior model. And so to, you know, put things in perspective, um, I'm arguing right now for graph representations, you know, and reasoning about these graph representations using graph neural networks. I've shown you that these type of models can be used to reason about interpersonal factors, like the likelihood of people interacting with one another. And I now want to quickly show you that you can also use them to reason about group level factors, okay? And so for this, I'm going to slightly switch my problem. I'm gonna say, well, let's assume that I know of a group in a scene. I have a map for that space that maybe has you know, occupancy information. And what I want to do is predict where should a robot be positioned to be part of that group, okay? And so to do this, when we started thinking about this problem, we said, no way you need machine learning for this, right? It's, if groups are very regular, maybe you don't need that extra overhead that comes with machine learning. And so we decided to you know, think about how we could do this without machine learning. And this is what we did. We first said, okay, we know that groups normally are in circular shapes. So we're gonna fit a circular shape to the people that we know are already in the group. 
Then we're going to use optimization to compute a potential robot location. So for instance, in this group, it might be over here or here, or in this group, it might be over here. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use optimization where we're going to you know, use a black box optimizer to minimize this loss. This loss is penalties for deviating for my, from my circle. And so here, lighter color means lower cost, darker color means higher cost. There's gonna be a penalty for being too close to people. You know, I don't wanna violate personal space. My robot should not be on top of another person. And I'm gonna add a penalty for occupancy in my environment. And so you might get, you know, a final loss that looks like this. And then once I know, okay, this is sort of one solution to this optimization problem, I'm simply gonna orient my robot towards the center of that group. Looks reasonable, right? Now, one thing you, you need to be careful here is that this optimization approach is, is definitely non-convex and there's lots of local minima. And so to deal with that, we actually compute a distribution of potential solutions by starting the optimization from different places around the group. And that can give you all these light purple potential solutions. And then we pick the one that um, it ends up minimizing my loss. And that would be in this case, this darker arrow. And so this is what you get, right? If you apply perhaps the method ones, you might converge there but there's lots of other solutions um, that you might actually be able to compute. Now, this actually worked quite well in very prototypical scenarios, but there are some edge cases that are very annoying to deal with, and I'll show you one here. So let's say that you have people roughly in a line. Well, fitting a circle to a line, <laughs> that can be a problem that can lead to a very big circle. And so we started thinking, well, maybe uh, there's too many rules that we have to set up for this problem. What if, again, we go back to a data-driven approach? What would that do, right? And so for this, we tried a Wasserstein generative adversarial network. The, the big picture here is, as in any other GAN, we have a generator network, which is going to produce what we want. It's going to try to predict a pose for a robot in a group. And then we have a critic network that is going to produce a feature representation for real groups that come from a data set of example groups and for fake groups that are being generated based on the predictive pose from our generator. And ideally this critic network is gonna help train the generator by you know, trying to compute different uh, feature representations for these two types of data, okay? Now, these two networks, as you might see from this picture, look quite similar. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about how this generator network works. So our input is going to be very similar to before. We're going to have a fully connected graph where nodes are people, edges um, are for the most part irrelevant. We're just assuming the, the group is fully connected. And our global graph attribute here is a map of the environment plus um, noise that we pass to our generator. So this is actually a generative model that can produce different kinds of poses. And then we're going to have here two GNNs. One is going to reason about um, people's position and orientation based on just the graph nodes. And the other one is going to reason about people's position in relation to this map that we know of. Now, because of time, I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about this proxemics GNN. So what is happening here is on this section, um, first section, we're going to do our node update. And we're going to do that to generate an image. Okay. And so the input here are people's poses. We're gonna render them into a 2D representation where there's a blob right where people are. Think of it as rendering a map with a blob where the person is. And then we're gonna sum over all of these images to get a kind of image that has blobs for where everybody is, okay? Then we're gonna concatenate this image with our map representation and with our noise. And then finally, we're gonna output a joint representation for all of this information. You can think now of this last part of the network as our global graph attribute update that I described before. And so what we do is we use the, this proximity GNN to generate a feature representation for the position of people relative to the environment. We use this other GNN to reason about the orientation of people relative to one another that gives you another feature representation. And then using these two, we finally generate the pose for our robot. Now, you might imagine, right, GANs, hmm, that sounds like that needs a lot of data and is indeed true. And so here we resorted to simulations to generate a lot of examples for this problem. We use, for instance, virtual environments from the iGibson simulator. 
And there we generated very, very simple circular groups. Okay. Now, the circular groups, when we trained the model first, were not really making the model, um, I would say, as, as realistic as I wished. And so we ended up applying lots of data augmentation, like warping to this um, data and also angular noise to people's orientation to make the data look a little bit more similar to what you might see in sort of more real conversational groups. And so with that, we were actually able to train our GAN. And here are some example outputs in comparison to the geometric approach that I showed you before. Um, you can see in general, the geometric approach produces more diverse outputs than our GAN. However, the, the predictions of the GAN are actually quite reasonable. And so we said, well, how good is this? Hmm. It's hard for us to judge just by looking at these arrows. So we decided to ask a bunch of people to tell us what they thought. And so we went ahead and we rendered these solutions using Unity. And then we asked people, hey, how much do you think this robot is part of this group based on the images that you're seeing? And so we asked them you know, questions related to the location of the robot, but also questions related to the orientation of the robot. And what we found here was quite interesting. So there are two trends, OK? So this is our in-group measure, right? Higher is better, the robot is more part of the group. And for a group of sizes four, five, and six, turns out the GAN was better. But for groups of size two and three, turns out the geometric approach was better. Hmm. So what happened here? Well, the GAN, right, is a data-driven method. And we gen when we generated our data, we created these circular groups in a way, not paying too much attention to how many people were part of the group. But when you have just a few people, people tend to stand relative to one another closer together. And so when we generate our outputs from the GAN for small group sizes, oftentimes the robot would be farther away than what you got to see with the geometric approach and they actually made a perceptual difference for people. And so this brings me to my last requirement that I didn't mention before, which is that to really do this well, you need good data and ideally lots of data if that's possible. And so we've been thinking, right, how can we get good data for group HRI? And so, well, one approach is that you take advantage of data sets of human-human interaction data. Of course, you always have to be careful if people would actually act the same there as if you had a robot in the interaction. Another approach is that you say, well, I'm just going to go to the real world. And this is something that we're trying to do in my lab now, um, where you know, we want to deploy robots in the public and get data that way. Of course, there is a lot of overhead that comes with it. right? You want to make sure that your robot is safe and you can actually you know, operate there for hours and perhaps days. And so there's you know, naturally a lot of overhead, even more the how much people would approach your robot, meaning how much data you might get is something that is very dependent on the environment where you're deploying that robot. And so that can actually pose challenges from a data collection perspective as well. And so maybe, you know, we've been thinking perhaps there's something else we can do um, in addition to these types of data collections that is kind of a middle ground between these two. And so one idea here that I wanted to perhaps discuss today is what it would mean to have interactive online simulations be part of crowdsourcing studies. And so here the idea is, you know, maybe we can create online surveys that we can deploy in crowdsourcing platforms to quickly get a lot of data where these surveys include, include photorealistic simulations in which users can control an avatar and interact with the robot in that environment. Okay. Now, maybe this sounds not so novel to you, probably if you've ever say exported a simulation to WebGL, right? That's something that you can generally do. But one thing that for us is actually really important is to think about how we can have the simulations play along with the robot being controlled by the robot operating system. And this is because ideally, whatever logic is running in your robot in the simulation is something that you can easily translate to the real robot in the real world. And so when we try to do this, right, take a simulation like um, the social environment for autonomous navigation that we made to study social navigation, and then just deploy to a, a WebGL type of setup. Well, it turns out that all the robot operating system um, technologies that we had didn't quite work there. And so what we ended up doing was actually implementing extra infrastructure to serve the simulation on the cloud 
and render it there so that people could then use it without having to have any specialized hardware in their computer. And so the way we envisioned this was, you know, people, roboticists like us, we start by defining, at least in the context of navigation, some navigation tasks that you want, um, you know, people and your robot to do. Then you would run the simulation with rare infrastructure to run in AWS and using standard graphical desktop sharing tools in Linux, export the rendered graphics to a website, allow people to provide input via that website to the simulation so that maybe, you know, they could control even an avatar in the simulation and then embed the simulation into surveys that many people could go and answer in parallel in real time. And here you can naturally scale, you know, with one machine, having many simulations running in one machine, but you can actually scale, scale across multiple machines, all of which are serving simulations to multiple people um, in parallel, basically. And so I don't have time to go into the technical details, but I'll just show you a video. So this is a simulation running on a browser. Here we're giving access to a person to control a human avatar. And in the back end, there is a robot that is being controlled via ROS um, in the cloud. And what you can do is, you know, you can ask the person to complete tasks in the simulation and then in your survey, ask them, hey, what do you think of the robot? You know, did the robot move appropriately according to, to this situation and so on. And maybe that way, you know, you can do very early sort of iteration on your algorithms before you actually go and deploy them in the real world. Now, interestingly, we have found that human feedback collected via this type of interactive surveys can differ from feedback from video surveys. And my hypothesis here is that these interactive surveys are a better way to sort of engage people in the moment. But we actually don't know yet, you know, what type of feedback that we got before is actually closer to the real world. And so we're trying to understand, right, what are the limitations of this type of methodology in terms of the data that you might be able to get in the real world. Now, we're also working on social navigation using the, the Sean um, sort of infrastructure that I showed you before. And by the way, we're working with other researchers at CMU to create a benchmark for social navigation. And so if this is something that interests you, you know, please keep an eye for this, because maybe, you know, in the future, we might be able to use this infrastructure that we've created to start comparing algorithms at a community level, which I think is very important for this um, sort of space of research. And so to summarize here and end my presentation, I want to recap, right? I've talked today about how we can advance robot autonomy for group HRI. I try to sell you sort of this part of this space. And in particular, I propose that maybe we should be representing group interactions via graphs. This is of course not a new idea on itself, right? Um, there's a lot of work that has happened for many years in social network analysis using graphs to represent interactions. I think the key difference here is that when you think about social networks, oftentimes you think about humongous graphs, right? What might be the social network for Twitter and things like that, which is really big graphs. And in at least situated group HRI, we often tend to have smaller graphs, but the dynamics of these graphs are actually really complex because every time, right, there's new things that are happening. And I think that brings up sort of interesting challenges to us. Now, I've also told you that, you know, perhaps graph neural networks are an interesting type of model to reason about these abstractions. And one key thing that I wanted to highlight here is that if this algorithm that I present to you today seems familiar to you, it probably is because it was inspired by belief propagation in graphical models. Now, the key difference between graphical models and graph neural networks is that graph neural networks can learn representations from the raw inputs. And perhaps this opens up some interesting opportunities, you know, in the context of HRI. Now, I show you, right, that we can use these GNNs to reason about interpersonal factors, to reason about group level factors. But there are still big questions that remain and I don't have answers for today, but perhaps this is you know, worth thinking about. One of them is how do we add reasoning about uncertainty to these type of models? How do we add reasoning about causal effects that could be really helpful for these type of interactions? And this is obviously you know, big questions in machine learning, but perhaps there's interesting solutions for HRI in the type of problems that I've described. And so with that, I'm gonna end by thanking, you know, all my collaborators, especially the students that have made a lot of this work possible and also our funding sources. And I'll leave you here, the link to my lab in case you want any more specific details. Thank you so much, Marinelle. This was an amazing talk.
Um, we are running short in time, so I will just have time for one question, but I do invite people to join the Slack to engage with Marinelle and the link for the Slack will be pasted here again on the chat. Um, so, Philippe, I saw you had your uh, hand raised. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, maybe I can ask it real quick. Uh, but first of all, Marinelle, uh, it was a wonderful talk. Your work is amazing. And it's really interesting to see the direction where you're going into these topics of groups and HRI. But I'm going straight to the point. So my question is, um, I have the feeling, and correct me if I'm wrong, that data-driven models have the assumption that human-robot interaction should be like human-human interaction. So my question to you is how can we change or, or adapt these models to account that these interactions might be slightly different? And I can give like a, a, tiny, a, a, a simple example. Imagine the notion of personal uh, space. It might be different between a robot and, and a person. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So. I would say that is definitely true. And perhaps your feeling comes from the fact that sometimes when we do machine learning, a lot of the data that is available is human human data. And so, you know, we oftentimes start from there to build these kind of models. But from a, from a modeling perspective, this is actually not a limitation of these models, right? Because if you had human robot interaction data, you could apply the exact same algorithm and the algorithm in principle would adapt to that kind of different situation. What I think is you know, perhaps relevant to think about is what changes when suddenly you have human-robot interaction data. And so to give you an example, right? Um, some of the human-human um, data sets, they oftentimes have a third-person perspective, right? When you start having a robot, perhaps you're bound to a first-person perspective. And what does that mean in terms of the inputs of your model? I think you know, that could be something that makes your, your model significantly different depending on what you're doing. And you know, that may be sort of something that you may need to explicitly sort of deal with if you go from human-human data to human-robot data. But at the end of the day, I think the notion of data driven by itself is not against you know, sort of human-robot interaction data. In fact, this is something we're trying to do now by deploying robots in the wild. My idea was, oh, it's so hard, right? To get data in the lab, bring people, especially if you need to recruit groups. What if someone doesn't show up? What do you need? What do you do with other people that showed up but cannot really run your study? Well, let's just take the robot out of the lab and hope that we can get good data there and start applying machine learning there because, well, there's also lots of extra problems that come along in more unstructured interactions. Um, but yeah, in general, I would say the, the key thing is that, that we need to think about is what changes when you do have a robot there. And you're right, right? The interactions are not necessarily the same. This is a great question. Um, maybe just one more question, since we are so engaged. Um, someone else would like to ask something? I'm happy to ask a question. Uh, ahead, first, Mary, no, that was a, that was an awesome talk. Absolutely fantastic talk. I love every second of that. Um, my question was, I, I really love the push on like an interactive uh, simulator. I am curious uh, uh, how you might think that we might address differences in say like, you know, physical interactions versus uh, just pure like simulated, but like keyboard based interactions uh, versus maybe uh, experiences that we might get in VR or even given Facebook's, mm -hmm. you know, recent push in, in metaverse uh, kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, do, do you see like us exploring experiments uh, in these different realities and applying them to the real physical world? I think the short answer is yes, but we also know already there are many things that are different. Um, and so there have been already some papers that show that, you know, even proxemics reasoning within VR and the real world may not be necessarily the same. And so the way I see these simulations is at least in the context of navigation, because there are some things that are really hard to simulate and really we don't have a good solution, right? But at least in the context of navigation, I think one of the big challenges is that it's really, really hard to compare how a navigation system compares to another one. And this is because just building one system, oh my God, is so much work, 
And so when you look at papers in this area, right, what happens is that oftentimes people would put a lot of effort into building their system, which makes a lot of sense. And then just take whatever else you can run off the shelf, typically the ROS navigation stack and see, okay, how do we do in comparison to that? But there's no kind of wide evaluation of, you know, this algorithm versus this other set of the R algorithm, because each of them is a whole set of problems. And even more, if you have different robots, oh gosh, what do you do? And so, what we're thinking about here as for simulations of well, but maybe perhaps they're in an interesting environment to compare, have people contribute their algorithms on their similar interface and start comparing things in all sorts of different situations. And by allowing people to have an avatar in this world, you can start getting a little bit of the subjectivity of the problem. Right, because someone could be experiencing what it means to be navigating nearby this robot that is running under this algorithm versus what it means to be navigating nearby this other robot running this algorithm. Now you're totally right in that there's lots of challenges from a human pers perception perspective. I can tell you a funny story about this. So the first experiment we did, sometimes we were running in this case, the navigation stack, sometimes the navigation stack would freeze, <laughs> also known problem for this algorithm. And people would actually try to help the robot, but they only had keyboard control that allowed them to move their avatar. And so they would approach the robot and then like start pushing the avatar. And that looked like they were kicking the robot, which is not what they were meaning to do. And so if you think about sort of the, the input capabilities that we're giving to people and what they can actually do in the world, I, I wouldn't say, you know, right now we have a magical solution to make this look 100% real. But if you think about this tool as a quick way to start evaluating algorithms on a community level for prototypical scenarios, and even for you to do quick development before you actually go and deploy in the real world, then I think there's lots of value in that space, right? I don't think this is gonna replace at any point in time sort of real world interactions. It's just another way to, you know, scale so that hopefully you can do early development. Great. Thank you so much, Marinelle. Um, you've been talking a lot. I see some people with showing a lot of love and support. I just wanted to mention that in the chat because you might have missed it. Um, awesome. And yeah, let's just thank once again, Marinelle, for the amazing talk. Please go to Slack on the channel Marinel Vasquez to ask questions to Marinel. She will be seeing them when she has time. And in the in 30 seconds, I'm just going to share with you our next session. Uh, we'll be with Professor Ruth Eilert from Harriet Watt University. She will actually be presenting her new book, Living with Robots, What Every Anxious Human Needs to Know. So you can buy the book and come to the next session, which actually will be right next week. Um, we want to thank our sponsors, Animatas and Semio, for helping us keep the infrastructure in place and being such amazing supporters to our work. And with this, thank you so much. We will see you next time.